Hello. I've only ever owned three vices. The first was this little Paramo number one. I got by with it for quite a few years and I've hung on to it as it's portable and it works where it's easier to move the vice to the job rather than the job to the vice. The international standard for vice sizing seems to be the can of pop, so I'll go with that. The Paramo got replaced when my brother gave me this 6 inch Clark. This is far more versatile and even has a small anvil, but the quality's not as good. I've always really wanted a decent quick release vice, but they either go for more than I wanted to pay or the carriage is a killer. Or both. After biding my time, I recently got lucky with a record number 23 for sale locally. Exactly what I was after. Record have been around since the early 1900s and are pretty well known in the UK for having made close to a century's worth of decent quality vices. My number 23 is an older pattern type. Going by the tool catalogues, the design changed slightly in the mid 1960s. In the 1964 catalogue, the number 23 has a round meatball and a recessed record badge. By the 1966 catalogue, the meatball squared off and the badge is embossed proud. The changing meatball shape and badge are a bit easy to see in the flesh. The rest of it looks to be fairly similar. Though on closer inspection, there are one or two minor differences. On the old type, the oil hole is accessed with the jaws opened, but on the newer type, the jaws have to be fully closed. The shelf at the back is slightly different too. The footprint's identical though. Going back from 1964, the round meatball seems to be a consistent feature. And going forward from 1966, the square meatball takes over. That puts my new vice at at least 55 years old. The number 23 fitters vice is still available, but I imagine it may have evolved again since Irwin got involved sometime in the early 2000s. It's in pretty good condition for its age. It's a bit rusty, but it's the kind of rust that comes from neglect in a damp garage, rather than being left outside or buried underground. The cast iron isn't pitted, it's mostly surface rust. The steel handle and meatball are slightly worse, but not terrible. Record stuff is usually round or blue, and at first sight my vice looks to be a sickly green, but there are a few bits of blue hidden under all the grime. You might argue this is a restoration film, but I didn't really want to call it that. Things that get restored often end up in glass cases to be admired, but never used. I'm considering this more of a 10,000 mile service. Once I'm finished, I'll try and look after it, but as it'll be my new workshop vice, it'll likely get a few hammer marks and bruises along the way. Hopefully, once I've freshened it up, it'll still be going strong in another 55 years, which is more than I can expect for myself. The first thing I did was dismantle the vise. I started by removing the two screws at the front. This would allow me to remove the front bracket, quick release assembly and the main screw. Out of interest, one thing not shown on the exploded diagram is this washer, which is important if you want to avoid the movable jaw falling out onto your toes. I added some penetrating oil as one of the screws didn't want to come out. I found out later it wasn't just tight, it was bent. That meant I had a couple of Whitworth screws to find before I could put it all back together. Here I'm putting tension on the trigger so the rocker bar doesn't unwind when it clears the half nut, and then withdrawing the lead screw and quick release together. Although it's definitely seen some use, there's not much in the way of wear on the thread. With the screw removed, the dynamic jaw could be slid free. It was much easier to handle in smaller pieces. Whilst it was upside down, I spotted a stamp. I'm not sure this model was available in 1927, so I'm guessing it's an inspection mark or a pattern number rather than a date. If anyone knows for sure, leave me a comment. Next I remove the guide bracket and half nut, just a couple more quarter Whitworth screws to undo. These have square heads, the ones on later vices seem to be hex. The last thing to remove were the jaw plates. I'd expected slotted screws, but mine has 5 16 BSF socket heads, so they may not be original.
With everything separated, I used white spirit and some old brushes to soften up the worst of the clag. Once everything was reasonably clean, I set to with wire brushes and emery cloth to remove the rust and loose material. Eye protection is absolutely essential when using wire wheels. My fleece was like a pincushion when I'd finished. Cleaning up the meatball was going to be easier without the handle in the way. Part of me thought removing it was just plain vandalism, and part of me thought if it made the job easier, then why not? The handle's 5 8 diameter, and finding half a metre of 16mm EN8 that I had left over from something else made up my mind. I reckoned it would be as quick to make a new handle from scratch than try and clean up the old one to the point where I'd be happy with it. With the handle removed I could concentrate on the meatball. Then I got on with making up a replacement handle. I started by reducing the ends of a foot long piece of the EN8. And then I made up end knobs from some inch diameter bar. After softening the end up, a bit of work with a ball peen hammer made it a permanent feature. I added a couple of leather washers to reduce the clanking and the chances of blood blisters later on. After wiping everything over with PT8 thinners, I undercoated with zinc phosphate grey primer. I started with the smaller bits first to get a feel for how the paint went on. It's quite thick and high build, so it filled the pores and scratches in the castings. I'm a ham-fisted painter at best, but it resisted most of my attempts to make it run and sag. Once dried, I top coated with BS381C110 Roundel Blue Gloss. If I hadn't been in such a rush to check out from the online shop, I'd have probably gone with a satin finish. I'm sure the shine will wear off a bit with time. Like the primer, the enamel was really forgiving and went on surprisingly well. Record stuff doesn't usually have the lettering outlined, but Made in England isn't something you see much these days, so I thought it deserved highlighting. Once the paint was touched dry, I removed the tape and gave it a couple of days to fully harden before I started reassembly. The jaw plates went back on with new slotted screws. I reassembled the quick release mechanism and left the spring loose, so I could retension it when it was back in the vise. I oiled up the contact points and refitted the sliding jaw.
Just a quick note about the buttress thread. It's not symmetrical. And although it kind of feels like it's meshed okay when it's the wrong way round, the thread only properly engages one way. I oiled up the nut and fitted it back in position, then replaced the bracket. Incidentally, my bracket is cast, but it looks to be pressed steel on later vices. I coated the entire screw with oil, including the bits that don't touch anything, to try and keep the rust at bay. I used ISO 68 slideway oil, as I already had some on the bench. It's a bit stickier than general purpose oil, which should help it stay put and not just run off. I hooked the quick release mechanism on and then offered it up to the vise. I engaged the rocker bar while sliding in the screw, not forgetting the washer at the back just before the screw was fully home. I secured the front bracket with two new slotted screws. The castellated tensioning nut looks to be cast, and I didn't want to risk breaking it by manhandling it with grips, so I modified a really cheap 18mm spanner to fit. I turned it three flats to get a nice feel. It's not so tight that the screw will wear, but not so loose that the nut disengages when the jaws are tightened. It's not exactly like new or a perfect showpiece, but I'm happy with the result. With luck, it'll outlast me. And that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching.